Hello and welcome to Politics Today. And in this programme today, we'll be discussing the House of Lords, asking should it be abolished, should it be reformed, in light of the news that uh, many peers who uh, support uh, the Remain campaign are blocking Brexit. So to discuss this issue today, I'm joined by uh, Peter McAvenna, of, uh, who's a researcher in the House of Lords and also Sig Cordal, leader of the Christian People's Alliance. Uh, gentlemen, welcome to the programme. Thank you. Um, I'll start off with you, Peter, because, you know, this is this is your job. You work in the House of Lords. You've, you probably know more about the House of Lords than any of us. Um, so I just want, to, if you describe for us how the House of Lords actually works, because it's an elected chamber, but it acts as a second chamber to scrutinise government policy and government legislation, doesn't it? Yeah, you know, it acts as a, a checks and balance um, to the Commons, so the Commons can push something through. It does have to go through the Lords, and generally the Lords have played ball on these things. Uh, generally they've made amendments, but generally have submitted to the will of the Commons. Um, but obviously this time it, it's quite different, and the Lords is very much a, a Europhile chamber, very much so. Um, I think the last, the EU withdrawal bill, when it was debating in the Lords, there were maybe 15 lords who spoke uh, in favour of Brexit and the other 190, 200 spoke in favour of Remain. So it is absolutely, and from their point of view, the people are not intelligent enough, they've made the wrong decision and it's up to them to help them fix that and to um, change the decision that the public have made. Um, so th that's where we are, as a general has worked, but in this case, um, it, it, they're letting their bias really stand in the way and forcing their view over the people. And at the moment, it's going to be a constitutional chaos because it's going to go back and forth, back and forth, ping-ponging back and forth. Uh, and um, the, the Commons will have to force it through some way, but it is going to be quite chaotic in doing that. Or they may just accept all the amendments and we may never get Brexit. Um, isn't there a great danger that many peers uh, in the House of Lords are actually going against the democratic process and the will of the people? Um, what are your thoughts, Sid? Yes, uh, and on most issues, the House of Lords has been quite willing, as Peter says, to bow to the House of Commons. I mean, what needs to be made clear here in this situation is that there was a very clear manifesto commitment to have a referendum on the um, British membership of the European Union and a clear commitment by the government that whatever the British people decide, we will implement. So in the last election in 2015, I should say, um, the uh, British people voted on that manifesto and voted in a Conservative government on that manifesto, very clearly. So th there's, there's a democratic commitment to it. Now, the House of Lords, by convention, does not go against any manifesto commitment that has been voted on. So this is really the first time that the House of the Lords is defying the will of the people. And it's very clear that they are. I mean, they can make excuses for it, but they are defying the will of the people in this situation. Uh, and um, Peter, why do you think they're doing this? Obviously, they have uh, vested interests. I know there are many uh, commissioners um, in the former commissioners in the House of Lords uh, that uh, um, that were that played an active role in supporting the whole European project. But but surely there has to be a, a realization amongst peers that um, that by doing this, they're actually blocking the will of the people and actually um, actually preventing. Um, the will of the people being carried out through legislation, particularly in light of the uh, government's uh, Brexit withdrawal bill? Well, there are, there are only about 25 actually members who looked into this and 25 members of the Lords who have been MEPs or commissioners. So it's actually not a massive amount. So actually then there's a bigger problem because it's not just that small group, although they're very vocal, um, the Kinnicks and the others. Uh, but actually you're suggesting that they understand what people on the street feel. And I think there are quite a number in the Lords who are in a certain class bubble and they do not get the issues on the street. They do not get the frustration of immigration and how that affects it, how it drives down wages. Uh, they, they just do, have not visited these communities and understood the, the massive changes that uh, communities have faced and the powerlessness that these people feel. Uh, when, I guess when you're a member of the Lords, uh, you can speak to power and you're at a certain level. And they really do forget that those people on the streets do feel disfranchised and powerless um, and feel that their voice is not being heard. 
Um, and I think th maybe the members of the Lords need to have some coach coaches and just go and visit some of these communities, talk to people on the street, and maybe they'll begin to understand. Uh, but as that is not going to happen, um, I don't think they're going to change their view. They're not going to change their view because actually they do believe the EU project is wonderful. They believe it's fantastic. Part of it is business interests, yes, but actually it is an ideological blindness that they do believe that this is great for us. They believe it saved us from lots of wars. They believe it's brought peace, uh, which is nonsense because that's NATO. Uh, and they uh, believe that it, it keeps down any populist agenda that may rise up and damage the status quo. So it's not going to change in the Lords. Uh, do you think it's time that, um, you know, the Liberal Democrats uh, for, for decades now have been um, supporting uh, uh, and advocating the position that the House of Lords should be uh, democratic and uh, each member of the House of Lords should be democratically uh, voted for. Um, what is the policy of, of the CPL on this and what are your views? Okay, well, we believe that there needs to be a second chamber um, because it's important to have some sort of uh, counterweight to the House of Commons uh, to, to examine material. Uh, and we believe it should be elected on a different basis from the House of Commons. So we would like to see a proportionally elected chamber with no limit, no, no underlying limit. Often with proportional representation elections, like for the European Parliament, you say there has to be a threshold of 5% before anyone can be elected. Well, we believe for the House of the Lords should, there should be no threshold. So provided you can actually get enough votes to, on a proportional basis to, to get a seat, you should have a seat um, uh, in the House of Lords. So that would then mean that you'd have a chamber that was representing really everyone in the country on a proportional representation basis, which the House of Commons, of course, doesn't do, because um, the way that the voting system works for the House of Commons, um, you only get the major parties represented there. So you'd have a second chamber with a lot more views represented. And you wouldn't necessarily to have to have enormous number of people. I mean, you could maybe have a chamber of maybe 200 or so um, there representing, and uh, that would then, I believe, work. Um, but um, yeah, that's our policy. Yeah. And uh, yeah, Peter, you work in the House of, uh, of, uh, House of Lords. Um, is there a, you, you talked earlier about um, a lack of understanding amongst uh, the majority of peers, understanding how ordinary British people think. Um, but what reforms do you think need to be implemented? Do you think that, uh, you know, that the government should encourage more people who have a diverse background in trade and industry and business in the positions of the House of Lords? Or do you think it should just be opened up democratically or, or should we abolish it? No, you, I don't believe you should abolish it. As Sid says, you need a, a second chamber to provide that balance. Um, you could just go back to the hereditary model. That's one way. Uh, you could have a hybrid system where you have some voted and some appointed. The, the problem is that um, prime ministers have used their powers to appoint people to the Lords so they can change the structure and so they can get legislation through. Um, that wasn't how it was meant to be. So whenever, uh, back in Harold Macmillan's days, in the late 50s, uh, he appointed maybe nine a year. Uh, so it was quite small. Um, there are only 300 seats for members, so in the Lords, there are 850 peers. So if they all turn up, uh, no one's going to get a seat. But that never happens. So he was appointing nine. If you jump ahead, actually, to Cameron's time, he appointed 40 a year. So that's why we have the problem of one of so many people, of two of people being rewarded not for their service to the nation, but being rewarded for their service to a political party. And that has to absolutely change because the moment when a prime minister puts forward names, uh, then those are looked at. And as long as they're law abiding, upstanding members of society and they haven't killed anyone recently, then they can get in. But I think that that threshold needs to be different. The threshold needs to be what have they given to society. And of course, the public can put names forward. And, and I think really has to be more of that, of those who have excelled and served the nation in education, in science, in health. Uh, let's take part from different areas of, of society. And those people should go in. But also, I think parliamentarians who possibly have served the nation but or maybe are, are getting older, do, can't stand elections or have lost a seat. I actually think it's a shame to lose that experience. And when you have the committees that look at legislation, I think it's vital to have those um, who know politics in and out, but also those who are in society and industry. So a mixture of those two. Yeah. 
And um, Sid, there, there are many uh, Remain peers who are actually pushing for a second referendum, um, and we're hearing this coming up uh, uh, a lot more now I I in the news coverage when it comes to, to, to Brexit. Um, again, isn't this going against the, the will of the people because the majority of British people voted to leave the EU, so why suddenly would they change their mind? Yes, um, this is something that we anticipated way back in 2016. We were saying that uh, if we vote to leave the European Union, this is when the battle will start. Because in every previous referendum, when people have voted against what the EU wants, they've been told you have to vote against. This happened in Ireland, it happened in, in, in Holland, and so on and so forth. So the logical thing would be that if we vote to leave the European Union, we'll be told that we've made the wrong decision and we have to vote again. Um, now, this quite honestly is perverse, uh, but it's the way the European Union operates. And um, there are spiritual issues here, the spiritual issues behind this, because um, Britain needs to be free from the yoke of the European Union. And the yoke of the European Union is something which is godless. It's been brought perhaps into sharp relief by the fact that uh, Ukraine, which is at the moment uh, a country which is applying to join the European, European Union, has been told that they must introduce same-sex marriage and they must introduce free abortion as a condition of joining. Now that shows that what the agenda of the European Union has become, something which is totally godless, as well as all the spiritual issues which David Hathaway has highlighted in relation to the Strasbourg Parliament being modelled on the Tower of Babel as a symbol of defiance against God, and Europa on the beast outside the Brussels, again, symbols of defiance and symbols of evil which the European Union has come. Now, Britain, by tradition, I mean, Britain actually means people of covenant. Um, the Queen, the coronation, is something which is a wonderful ceremony when the Queen vows that she will govern Britain under God, under the authority of God. And what we have now is a conflict between is God going to come back and rule Great Britain or is Great Britain going to remain under the yoke of this evil empire which is the European Union. It's a spiritual conflict that we're going through and we've got to see it for what it is. Absolutely. And um, yeah, P Peter, I mean, the, the House of Lords has a very big job on its hands, doesn't it? Particularly scrutinising the government's um, EU withdrawal bill um, and considering that having to go through almost uh, over 40 years mm. uh, of uh, EU legislation um, that have been incorporated into uh, British law. Um, is that also one of the challenges, the complexity of this bill, the complexity of us withdrawing from the European Union and how it kind of affects every aspect of British political life? Well, the complexity is an issue, uh, but I think it's made very complex so that it is an issue. And therefore, uh, they can point to it and say, this is too difficult, we really just need to go back on it. Um, so absolutely, it, it's a way of, of slowing down the process and stopping it. Uh, but I, I don't think the Lords really understand that um, if they do not vote this through, then we're leaving in, in March 2019 anyway, with or without any piece of legislation. So if you don't get the legislation straight, then, well, we just leave anyway. So they haven't quite grasped that. I think the, the focus should be more on having a, a proper trade deal and actually preparing for a no deal instead of forcing this piece of legislation because the massive amount of work that's focused on this, uh, it, could, it could just be a few lines to say we're going to leave, uh, it will uh, stay the same, the trade arrangements will stay the same, this is what we offer the EU, if they don't accept we leave. It could be very simple, but actually because they've made it so complex, that, that's why people are in darkened rooms for hours and hours, for nights and nights, I mean for 10 whole days they've debated this in the Lords. Um, what more can you debate? Uh, either you get out or you want to stay in, it's one or the other. Um, and people's minds do not really change by the long debates you have in the Lords or in the Commons. Um, but at the end of the day, they will have to accept, but they don't want to accept, so they won't. Absolutely. Uh, and, and Sid, if we look to the continent of Europe, it's not only um, Brexit that threatens the whole European project, but also Italy as well. Um, do you want to give us a bit of uh, an insight into what's happening in Italy with the, with the trouble with their elections and the possibility that uh, Italy could have a government that is uh, very Eurosceptic and could even pull Italy out of the, uh, of the Euro? 
Yeah, this is a fascinating situation which we've now developed in Italy. But again, it's interesting enough, there's a lot of spiritual forces at work here. Um, Italy has actually voted uh, for two main parties, both of which are very Eurosceptic, the Five Star Movement and the National League, one which is strongest in the South and the other which is strongest in the North. And these two parties have, have actually hammered out a coalition agreement uh, to rule Italy and controlling a majority in, in, in their parliament. Um, but what has then happened is that um, they've chosen a prime minister and they've chosen a chancellor or a finance minister um, who, who will then be responsible for the finances of the nation. The finance minister that they've chosen, some uh, Paolo Savona, uh, he's an 81-year-old economist, uh, but he's someone who is very against the euro. He was against the Maastricht Treaty. He's called um, the, the, um, the uh, euro a German cage. Now, uh, the, Italy has a prospect of a finance minister who says the euro is a German cage. You can imagine the EU is absolutely up in arms at this prospect. The only person that can stop this coming about is the Italian president, who himself is also very much in favour of the European Union. So the Italian president has stepped in, Sergio Mattarella, and he said, this man cannot be finance minister of Italy, it's going to put Italy in danger. Actually, what he means is it's going to put the European Union in danger, the European Union project. You see, because we know Anyone that lived through 1992 and Black Wednesday knows that tying your currency to all the other European currency is a very bad thing for your economy. And if you set yourself free from your currency being tied to all the other European uh, currencies, we get growth and, we get, and suddenly we get development. Now, so we know that if Italy uncouples itself from the European Union, it'll be a tremendous benefit to the Italian economy. And Paolo Savona knows that because he's a clever economist. And the majority of the Italian people probably know that. But they're being told they can't. They're tied into the European Union. It's going to destroy, destroy the European Union project so they can't go down that path. And at the moment, we have political crisis in Italy. But the uh, possibility remains that there's going to be further elections next September because this the president that they've, uh, that the pre sorry, this prime minister that the president's appointed as a caretaker prime minister cannot possibly hold the majority of, of the parliament in Italy because the majority of parliament is controlled by the Five Star Movement of the National League. So all he can do is be a caretaker prime minister and hold further elections. So the logical thing is that in the next elections, the Five Star Movement of the National League will have an even greater majority and will press ahead even more forcefully with what they're planning to do. And the president will be swept aside. It is a great danger for the EU project, but something that we as Christians can greatly welcome. And, uh, you know, Peter, uh, you know, we've had a discussion about the House of Lords, uh, you know, blocking Brexit uh, and, and the position of many uh, Remainer peers. But, you know, with, uh, with, with what's happening in Italy, um, looks like it could destable the entire European project. So is there... <laughs> awakening now amongst EU commissioners of their arrogance to kind of wake up and realise that they don't have the will of the European people on their side as they, mush, as they push closer and closer to a European superstate? You would think so, but no, they'll just double down, they'll just beat the people even more and tell them they have to accept uh, the medicine they're giving them. So, and it's, it's, it's exciting to see what's happening in Italy uh, because uh, the 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 new the suggestion of from the president for the new prime minister will be rejected by parliament and then that then means there's snap elections so then what happens they're then voted in with a larger majority as Sid said maybe sixty percent instead of the fifty percent then what does the president then put forward another person they then vote him down they have new elections we could be doing this thing for the next ten years in Italy until the president falls over and dies I guess so it, to me it's it's pure madness and and not just in Italy but you have issues in Hungary, in Czech and Poland, all which are being threatened with legal action by the EU because they don't accept the amount of refugees they're told they must accept. 
and then you've got Greece being kicked repeatedly by the EU. So somehow the EU, they will do anything to save their project, um, anything at all. And if that means ignoring the will of the people and reducing democracy down to this chaos, then they'll do it. Absolutely. Also, the other perspective to take into account, um, and that's the position of those who advocate uh, remaining within the European Union, is that I think the European Union and the, the Commission don't particularly want Britain in the EU anymore. <laughs> um, that's not something which I perceive, but um, it, it could be true. But um, no, I think what they're more concerned about is that um, we leave the European Union and prosper outside the European Union. That's the biggest danger. Because if we leave on good terms and everything goes well, then other countries that are currently in the European Union, that especially countries that are not in the Euro, um, could well look and say, well, wait a minute, we can, uh, we can benefit from, from leaving. Uh, like um, one example may well be Poland. I mean, Poland is unhappy within the European Union, although uh, perceives that there's some economic and political benefits to them. But if they see Britain leaving on good terms, Poland isn't in the euro, they've still got their own currency. Uh, Poland could say, come on, we're going we're, we're, we're to uh, ha have a referendum in Poland to see about leaving. And it could, could happen in many other countries that look and say, uh, 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 Ireland could, uh, could well say, wait a minute, there's, there could be benefits to us of leaving. Look how well it's gone for the uh, United Kingdom. We're going to be better linked to the United Kingdom than we are to the EU. We could, we could see the whole thing begin to collapse, especially with what's happening in Italy as well. Um, but um, for us as Christians, this ought to be and must be a subject of prayer because nothing can be taken for granted. Absolutely. Uh, and, and Peter, don't we have to look at this whole situation regarding Brexit and the government's position is that the government really don't know what their position is. It keeps changing from day to day out. Are we in the customs union? Are we out of the customs union? Um, are we going to have a, a, an agreement with the European Union, a trade deal? Or are we not going to have a trade deal? Um, there isn't much clarity coming fr from the government on, on this issue. What do you think the government needs to do in order to set its sail and uh, to actually implement Brexit and uh, fulfil uh, the desires of the majority of British people who voted to leave? Well, they could change the person at the top to someone who wants Brexit. That would uh, help. Maybe Jacob rees Mogg or someone who actually believes in it. If you've got someone leaving the country and they don't believe in what they're doing, they're never going to come out with a, a good outcome. So that, that's one possibility. But also they need to instruct civil servants and tell them this is happening. We want you to prepare scenarios to tell the government or recommend the government the way forward because the moment they're not doing that. So that's uh, another way of doing it. Um, with, to tell Ireland, to, uh, every, uh, Ireland were doing a lot of preparation work on uh, leaving, of having uh, an issue with the border and what had to happen to that. Whenever the new Prime Minister came in in the Republic, he cancelled all of that. So they're not doing any preparation. You need to prepare for what lies ahead or else the future arrives and then you haven't thought of what happened. So all of that with instructing people what to do um, and being positive about Britain. Uh, we've been looking at, in City Hall, we've been looking at the, the press every day, so looking at City AM especially because that's the business news that comes out. Every day you see three, four positive news stories about Britain. Now if you watch the BBC you'd think actually Brexit is really negative, it's really bad, we're going to crash and burn, it'll be a disaster and we'll go back on our knees to the EU with our begging bowl. But actually everything is extremely positive and when you look at any banks that talk about leaving, actually they're moving 100 staff to have a subsidiary in the EU so they can continue. They're not leaving but the headline in the BBC is bank relocates. They're not relocating, they're moving a hundred of their staff out of 20,000. So I think the government needs to start talking about Britain and being positive and looking at the business stories that are happening and stop the uncertainty which is over at the moment and saying we're leaving the EU, that means we're leaving the customs union, we're leaving the single market, we're leaving, that all comes as a package, you cannot pick and choose. Um, and what does that mean going ahead? So if they set down the framework, say this is the path we're going, you can prepare for it. But you're right, there's so con much confusion um, that no one knows what's happening or if we ever will leave in the end. Uh, and, and Sid, what were the dangers um, for democracy if the A, the House of Lords continued to block the government's uh, withdrawal bill and those in positions of power and influence block the will of the people by trying to block Brexit? 
That's a good question. You see, it's, um, at the moment, I think uh, the whole situation, in a sense, is being saved by Jeremy Corbyn's position, which is um, why there's a lot of people um, in the media and within the Labour Party desperately trying to get him to shift his position from somebody who is saying, yes, we've got to uphold, to support the referendum, we must leave. I mean, we know may not be happy with the terms on which he's saying we should leave, but at least Jeremy Corbyn's position is we must leave. And as long as his position is we must leave, we will leave. If he changed position and said, no, the British people have made a mistake, we must have a second referendum, then you would then probably find uh, you'd have a majority in the House of Commons that would then be saying we must have a second referendum, and then that would put the whole Brexit plan in jeopardy. But at the moment, we have a clear uh, will within the House of Commons um, to proceed, to leave. Now, as long as that is the case, then uh, the convention is that the House of Lords, uh, as Peter said earlier, will send bills back to the House of Commons, the House of Commons will send them back to the House of Lords, and uh, this can carry on two or, two or three times until the House of Commons says, we've had enough of this, we're now invoking the Parliamentary Act and uh, going ahead anyway. And last, down to the last uh, two minutes of programme, uh, Peter, how and what role can our viewers play and Christians play in uh, defending our democratic values in this country um, by putting pressure on the government to make sure they implement what the British people have asked them to do? Uh, well, it's, it's quite difficult because uh, the government is not worried about upcoming elections, so they can just get on with what they want to do. Uh, the governments are always short-sighted, uh, so they only do things for the next few years until that's why actually some of the benefits in in the lords that you don't have an election coming up so in theory they can plan ahead and they're thinking about what's best for the country in theory as opposed to what the electorate want uh, but i think as as christians we just really need to pray uh, it's vital that we um, educate our churches so if our viewers are uh, involved in church then go and talk to some leaders say actually uh, i'm interested in what's happening politically who is the person in our church who's involved politically uh, can i meet with them or if no one is then put yourself forward and say Look, I, i'm interested in this stuff how can we bring this stuff into the church as prayer to really educate the church inform them because the danger is that many people in our pews actually are not interested and actually they don't vote so uh, sid uh peter Thank you so much for being my guest on this edition of uh, Politics Today. Thank you. And I just want to thank you all for watching uh, this programme. I think it's imperative that we put pre pressure on our members of the House of Lords to not block the will of the people by blocking Brexit. So, Lord, we pray that uh, he would have mercy upon our government at this time and should give them wisdom so they implement the will of the people. So thank you for watching Politics Today.